This lecture is about how to predict evolution. I will illustrate the, the, uh, the power to predict by uh, discussing a subject that is familiar to everyone, namely the, um, the changing designs of uh, airplanes and uh, helicopters. The, uh, the uh, more important message is that uh, contrary to uh, the impression that we get uh, when we hear the word evolution out of biology, is that uh, evolution is not uh, entirely random. It is uh, predictable because it, con it constitutes repeated uh, changes that uh, impress us with a particular direction in time. Uh, my lecture is based on my most recent book called uh, Freedom and Evolution. And first, um, why is this lecture about us? It is because everything that moves uh, on Earth, including everything that uh, surrounds us uh, as it moves on Earth, uh, does so because it is pushed. It is pushed by power. The power comes from engines, which are contrivances, natural or uh, human-made, that convert um, heating into work, or uh, work per unit time, which is power. And the power produced uh, in this particular sketch the power is exiting to the right, the heating is entering from the left, and uh, in the blue domain there is a uh, population of uh, contrivances, uh, natural and uh, man-made. Uh, the, the number of these uh, flow architectures, these drawings, is, is, is immense, uh, and these drawings are a combination of old and new, meaning that, um, that the uh, contrivances have been evolving over time. This is only half of uh, the uh, so-called uh, thermodynamics of nature. The other half is uh, what I sketch here in green. The power produced uh, by engines is destroyed immediately in the green domain, which is another world of flow configurations, the green domain that dissipates the power. I call them brakes. Uh, it is basically the flow, uh, relative motion against the environment. The mover makes progress horizontally on the surface of the earth because it displaces its immediate environment. No environment is uh, willing to get out of, out of the way unless uh, work is done on it. So, uh, so that's the big picture, meaning that the uh, heating from the from a source, say the sun or, fo or food, um, is converted into power. The power is dissipated uh, because of movement. And uh, in uh, the blue domain and in the green domain, there are flow configurations. They change over time. They change by themselves. They morph with freedom. And this is true of uh, the geophysical world, meaning the air currents and oceanic currents. The, uh, the animal sphere, the human sphere, and all of this movement, visibly, meaning pictorially, is evolving in, into configurations that provide greater access. The name for this entire uh, um, plot, movie plot, is uh, sustainability. This is where we come from. This is also where we're heading. And uh, so uh, we are not, uh, nature is not um, a catalog of still images, as we might get the impression from uh, the uh, botany book, the zoology book, the, uh, the anatomy book. No. Uh, nature is movies on top of movies on top of movies. And then, of course, uh, our minds that have the ability to remember these impressions. In 1996, I summarized this uh, vision in one brief statement called the Construct the Law, which is that uh, for a flow system to persist in time, and this is the definition of to live, or the definition of uh, a live flow system in physics, as opposed to a dead one, uh, that system must evolve with freedom, such that it provides, it provides greater access to what flows. Um, I illustrated this with uh, three uh, snapshot evolution of a river basin. The, uh, the drawing is always arborescent, but from one um, frame to the next, the tree flows more easily. So evolution is uh, the change in flow configuration 
change after change with directionality, directionality that makes sense to the observer. And uh, the one word uh, uh, summary of uh, the summary called the constructive law is that this is uh, the definition of a change or the t definition of time, which is the difference between new and old in physics. Now, uh, with a law of physics, the human mind is empowered to imagine uh, what will be, in other, in other words, to come up with, uh, with uh, mental viewings that uh, deserve uh, attention and uh, deserve respect, uh, such as, uh, for example, the law of gravitational fall, uh, you know, in, in your mind, uh, <laughs> what to do and not to do when you're on the balcony, you don't jump, okay? That is the usefulness of the law. And so with the law, uh, we uh, unwittingly uh, make predictions and we act uh, next in our own interest. Here is um, the result of one such prediction. This is work from uh, 2006 with uh, a biologist, a colleague of mine, uh, Jim Marden. Um, we uh, predicted animal locomotion everywhere by invoking the constructor law. We uh, came up with uh, the result, that the prediction, that the speeds of all the movers uh, plotted here on the ordinate should be uh, uh, proportional in a particular proportionality with the body mass raised to the power one-sixth. Uh, flyers um, are relatively faster than swimmers, but the, the uh, relationship is the same. It's shown with a solid line for flyers, with a dashed line for swimmers. Uh, we collected all the data that was available back then and discovered that all the, um, all the movers are in fact uh, have evolved, have evolved, uh, meaning have uh, exhibited in the convergent evolution that was in fact predictable from the constructor law. Uh, more recently, uh, with colleagues uh, from the Yildiz Technical University in, uh, in Istanbul, uh, I've shown that um, human-made um, uh, movers, such as uh, all the shipping, uh, agrees with the swimmers, and so do all the flyers. In this uh, older drawing, the flyers appear to uh, deviate uh, upward from the predicted um, uh, theory. However, uh, that is uh, a, uh, a wrong impression because the airplanes are in fact uh, flying through an atmosphere that's uh, friendlier, meaning uh, uh, rarefied in comparison with the atmosphere near the, near the ground where the birds are struggling. So uh, when one adjusts for the difference in air density, then uh, the airplanes are no different than the theoretical line. So uh, success of this kind is uh, an invitation to, uh, to uh, continue to rely on the law. Now, uh, the reason why uh, the uh, human-made uh, movers uh, be, perform the same way as the uh, animal is that we are uh, uh, a uh, highly evolved uh, animal species which I called the human and machine species because each of us is not a naked body each of us is encapsulated in uh, contrivances add-ons uh, artifacts that um, that uh, empower us to be uh, obviously uh, uh, more powerful yes than the than uh, naked. So in this uh, sequence of three snapshots from uh, a long time ago to uh, our future, uh, from the uh, naked human to the uh, human with the tool and now uh, human with uh, everything plus uh, uh, intelligence in the mind but also artificial intelligence, the, uh, the specimen, the specimen, you and I, is becoming uh, a more powerful one than yesterday. So, the, uh, now we're starting the, uh, the two examples of uh, my presentation. Airplanes are these uh, biggest uh, human movers that we have through the air. Uh, here we have a uh, panoply of, uh, of the uh, models of airplanes that have been adopted during their uh, uh, six or seven decades of uh, uh, commercial jet aviation. Uh, you see a mountain of uh, of the pictures. Uh, some of the models are big, others are small. 
uh, over time, the bigger have been joined by even bigger models. But, but that's one uh, trend. The other trend is that the, uh, in every decade, for example, the past uh, 10 or 20 years, the new models are arriving uh, in all sizes. And the new that are big are few, and the, uh, the many that are small, sorry, the small are many. So, uh, so uh, in every uh, uh, decade, we have a, uh, a diversity of, uh, of uh, new models that uh, vehicle uh, uh, humanity on the globe. Uh, the diversity uh, is of two kinds. One is what I just said, that the sizes are not the same. We have a uh, few large and many small. The other one is that uh, two models of the same size, even when one is a copy of the other, are not exactly the same. And now I will uh, look into this particular feature, which is, uh, as you'll see next, also predictable. Um, every airplane has, uh, is actually a flying uh, house uh, full of uh, components, full of organs. Every airplane has engines. The engines have a size, which is different than the size of the airplane. From the constructor law, we're, we're able to predict that the engine size should be about one-tenth in terms of mass, uh, the, the, the size of the whole uh, airplane. Uh, this uh, compilation of uh, measurements uh, uh, supports that prediction. And, um, and it is an important prediction because uh, it, <laughs> while, uh, while predicting the future of the uh, engine size on airplanes, it also uh, answers uh, predictively uh, an observation from uh, zoology, which is that the, uh, the, uh, the, the muscle mass on any uh, natural flyer, a bird, is a fraction like this one of the whole body weight. Now, why should there be a proportionality between uh, uh, motor size and body size? That comes from um, a uh, trade-off a trade-off in the construction of the uh, flowing architecture. Uh, here, uh, the motor is, um, is uh, sketched uh, as, by me as a, as a heart. Uh, if uh, one examines uh, the, uh, the organ, the heart, in isolation, one knows from, th from thermodynamics that the heart is more efficient, therefore it uh, destroys less uh, useful uh, power if its uh, channels are wider, bigger. So a big size in the motor, also this is a tendency called economies of scale, big size means uh, greater efficiency. This would suggest that uh, the best motor should be the bigger, uh, the better motor should be the bigger motor. But uh, that uh, runs in conflict with uh, the, <laughs> the interest of the whole, which is the, uh, the airplane. Um, the bigger motor becomes a bigger uh, suitcase that has to be carried by the airplane, therefore uh, more fuel being spent on simply carrying the organ. So from the uh, conflict between the two trends, at the intersection of the asymptotes are, arrives the, uh, the uh, let's call it uh, compromise, where the best idea of what kind of an organ size serves uh, the, um, the whole airplane uh, the best. Uh, here we uh, learn one important thing, that the flow system in aviation is not the, uh, the organ such as the motor or the uh, environmental control system. The flow system is the airplane itself and all the airplanes that follow it on the same route. That is the river of people that um, through uh, human ingenuity is uh, evolving toward greater and greater access. In the same way, with the constructor law, we've predicted uh, that the wingspan and the fuselage lengths should, um, should converge toward a uh, proportionality uh, close to one to one. As you see here in the uh, cloud of data that has uh, been racing upward from uh, decade to decade. Um, also helicopters, uh, coincidentally, or I should say not coincidentally, have been uh, uh, converging uh, in the same evolutionary direction. So here on the ordinate is the specific fuel consumption. So yes, uh, over the years, uh, the, all the helicopters have been uh, evolving toward uh, <laughs> 
flying on Earth more and more economically. This is a compilation of uh, uh, the known models of uh, civilian helicopters shown in white and military helicopters shown in black. Um, just like for the, uh, for the airplanes, we uh, predicted and then validated the, uh, the prediction that the engine size should be a fraction of the body size, that uh, the engine size should be of the same order in terms of uh, mass as the fuel load, the rotor length scale should be the same as the body length scale. Remember the proportionality between wingspan and, uh, and the fuselage length. And um, here the specific work uh, per unit of fuel burned uh, should be greater when the engine is bigger. This uh, a very important uh, piece of physics which is predictable, uh, which is called the economies of scale, is in everything that uh, that uh, flows as a flow system and morphs with freedom. And um, with this, uh, uh, I uh, bring up the other feature of uh, diversity, which is the organization, uh, which is called hierarchy. Hierarchy in aviation begins on the ground. Um, on the left is the rectangular area of, uh, of uh, any airport, in this case, the Atlanta airport. It is a, a flow of humanity. Uh, that is uh, people uh, on, a, on the area and every individual has an interest very similar to the neighbor which is to get from any gate to any other gate including the, uh, the terminal. So uh, the solution which occurs to the group um, without uh, participating in a city council meeting is that the, the, uh, the airplane area shape should be a particular shape. In this case, the shape is the one that you see, and it is such that the time spent uh, by people who walk vertically in the blue, meaning along the concourses, should be the same as the time spent by the same people while sitting down or standing up and riding, riding on the train. This is the, uh, the, uh, the balance or the harmony between a few large and many small but it is actually a balance between the few, the few uh, um, fast and the many slow. Uh, in this case, the few fast is just one, and that's the train. This, uh, this architecture, which is called hierarchy, is uh, everywhere you look. For example, on, on terrestrially on land, the freight moves on the surface of the earth the same way in, uh, in uh, a few large and fast uh, trucks that uh, travel long, uh, carrying the same freight as the uh, more numerous, smaller and uh, slower uh, trucks that, um, or delivery vehicles that, uh, that uh, move uh, transversely. The uh, food chain is the same story in the, um, in the zo zoological uh, domain. Uh, and uh, our way of uh, uh, illustrating that is shown here in another uh, qualitative presentation of uh, population size versus body size. Uh, these are the populations of all the flyers from insects to the, uh, to the largest airplanes. Uh, this is um, qualitative uh, data from, uh, from zoology and the aircraft technology uh, align themselves in this uh, uh, direction on a log-log plot. The point is that the hierarchy occurs in nature uh, by itself, that is naturally, it, it just happens, just like the hierarchy of the, of the uh, river uh, channels in the river basin. And so here is the river basin of people, uh, uh, vehicle by aviation. This is an image from uh, satellites, an image of the condensation trails left by all flying aircraft uh, 20 years ago. Um, in, the, uh, in the red are the, uh, the, uh, the, <laughs> the, more, the most numerous uh, movers. In the blue, the, uh, the, uh, the fewer, the fewer. The point of the, uh, of the image is that uh, even 20 years ago, on Earth, you could fly from any point to, a to any other point. And uh, just like the red blood cells in the uh, human circulatory system, sooner or later, from any point A to any point B, the, uh, the, the passenger 
has to travel through the uh, two chambers of, of the single heart. The single heart is where this, uh, this embryo was born. It was born in, uh, in uh, Europe and North America and uh, across the North Atlantic. So uh, the vasculature would not change, will not change, it will remain the same, but all its uh, blood vessels and uh, musculature will become more robust. So the conclusion is that, uh, yes, uh, movement is hierarchical, that means, naturally, that means that fuel is consumed hierarchically, naturally, not uniformly, not in an egalitarian fashion, but in this distributed fashion, which is in fact uh, demanded uh, unwittingly by the interests of all the individuals who participate in this flow system. Uh, even better, or even more, the, uh, the hierarchical uh, consumption of fuel turns out to be, uh, this is empiricism, the same as the hierarchical distribution of wealth. I plotted here on the, on the, on the abscissa the uh, fuel used per year by any country in the world, and, um, and on the ordinate is the annual wealth reported um, by the same uh, country. So you see that uh, uh, fuel consumption hierarchy, which really means physical movement hierarchy, hier hierarchy is uh, synonymous with, with uh, wealth hierarchy. A key here is the fact that in, along the yellow bisector, all the, um, all the movers, in this case, uh, life societies, which are life flow systems, are racing upward uh, to the right. And that means that the future is one uh, that uh, uh, promises uh, not only greater wealth, but also uh, greater consumption of power and uh, more movement and uh, more reach. And on other slides that I don't have time to present, also greater freedom. So um, the, uh, there are a couple of... Uh, uh, conclusions to retain from this presentation. One is uh, uh, applies to uh, to research in academia, which is that theory. Uh, first of all, is the ability to see with the eyes of the mind. Uh, this uh, activity is called idea, coming from uh, ancient Greek. Uh, theory is the complete opposite of empiricism. Empiricism is uh, observing and then copying. Uh, most of what goes on in science, and especially in engineering, is of the empirical uh, kind. Uh, examples are uh, biomimetics and uh, reverse engineering, where the uh, designer looks around and uh, gets inspired from uh, what is observable. The, uh, this technique of, uh, of copying the observed it works when the observer is actually equipped with the physics principles that underpinned the occurrence of the observed object in the first place. A more um, uh, immediate, I should say, uh, immediate payoff versions of uh, uh, biom biomimetics and reverse engineering are uh, the outright theft of technology and plagiarism. Theory is eminently valuable because it gives you the power to predict, which is to know the future. It, for that reason, it it fast forwards technology evolution for those uh, who are in your hands or around you. It is the most economical way of doing that. And it is, it is uh, testable. The, th the theory uh, is screaming to be tested. And if, if correct, then the theory is reliable. You are in fact relying on, on uh, correct theories uh, all the time, especially in, uh, in aeronautics. Uh, boundary layer theory is something that everybody these days uh, uses without uh, without uh, paying uh, the, uh, the the uh, deserve the respects that need to be paid to Ludwig Prandtl. So that's the uh, the the conclusion that should apply to all the academics who are in this uh, conversation. If you'd like to know more, you should uh, uh, take an interest in the, my own evolution in this uh, uh, line of theoretical research. The constructor law began in 1996. It uh, continued with a decade of uh, textbooks. These are uh, textbooks that are used in courses. They have uh, proposed problems, solved problems, uh, solved examples, and lots of 
obviously illustrations that uh, morph. Uh, so these are my uh, textbooks on the constructal theory and design. During the past uh, 10 years, I've um, made the effort to, uh, to reach a much wider audience, which means everybody, especially young, um, young uh, uh, researchers, who are uh, uh, curious about uh, ideas, curious about uh, making a contribution in their lives, and, um, and who uh, are uh, totally disinterested, meaning they are not uh, competitors. They do not enter the uh, scientific debate or correspondence with, a, with a, a chip on their shoulder. So to the young in the audience, and maybe even to your children, I suggest that the way to start reading about constructal uh, law and theory and design is to start, uh, <laughs> as usual, with the best idea, which is try the simplest first, and that is to pick up my most recent book, Freedom and Evolution.